Good morning. A very warm welcome to all of you. I'm Alessandro Sanos, the Global Director for the Commodities and Strategy and Execution at Refinity. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual event organized by the CTA, the Alumni Association of the Master and Diploma in Commodity Trading of the University of Geneva. Today is the second session of the series on sustainability in the commodities market. We started last week with sustainable financing. Today, we'll be talking about sustainability-driven innovations in commodity trading. And next week, we will be closing the series by discussing sustainability and climate risk. You will be able to find all the information on the CTA's website, www.cta-association.com. I'll put the link into, into the chat, so don't worry about it. Before we start, allow me to quickly present uh, you today's speakers. Richard has been active on the operational side of commodity trading for over 20 years. He founded HR Maritime, which has been managing for over 13 years. And he's the president of SOS Mediterranean, Switzerland, and the Propeller Club in Geneva. Alexander is a graduate from the Master in Commodity Trading. He started his career at VRS as a ship broker, uh, which, and then he moved into the sustainability world by starting VRS Recycling Services. Since last year, Alexander has worked on launching VRS Green Desk to offer climate action and other innovative environmental solutions. And Paul, a former energy trader and developer of energy transition programs, he co-founded Climate Neutral Commodity a Swiss initiative that develops a new certification for carbon neutral commodity transactions. So without further ado, let's now explore sustainability driven innovation in commodity trading. And Richard, I would like to start with you, if that's okay. How has sustainability become an integral aspect for commodity trading companies? Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Alessandro. Pleasure to be with you here today. Um, I mean, sustainability is a huge subject, and it's something that we talk about all the time. We sometimes try to actually dissociate it from the business we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, which it really shouldn't be. Um, sustainability is important for everyday life. It's important for everyone in every industry. It's uh, vital for the public image of the company um, to obtain financing and also to have company or employee involvement within the company itself. And so trading com for trading companies this is becoming very, very important. Trading companies are becoming much more household names. Their public image is much more important. The days of them being these companies that were hiding behind the scenes is over. And so it's becoming very, very important. And also for them to be able to retain the employees and to attract new people into the industry, it's very important to show that the industry is sustainable. But again, we shouldn't pretend that sustainability is something that's completely separate from what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just basically doing what we do in a nice way, in, in a way that is actually sustainable, uh, that can go forward in the future. And Alexander, Paul, what is your view? Do you believe that sustainability will change the public image of commodity trading? Yes, so, um, so thank you. Thank you, Alessandro, and uh, uh, for uh, for welcoming me, for welcoming us. Uh, yes, I think that uh, sustainability uh, may definitely change uh, the image uh, of, uh, of uh, commodity trading groups uh, in the public, but also uh, within the industry, especially for groups who, that are already committed uh, to, uh, to support uh, sustainability. And we see that uh, traders, uh, commodity producers are already uh, investing, are already active in renewable, uh, in biogas, in hydrogen markets, and they really contribute to accelerate and to facilitate uh, energy transition. So um, I believe that uh, this, uh, this commitment from those groups are definitely improving their image, but it's also uh, a good contribution for them to, uh, to, uh, to see the business opportunities in energy transition markets. And, uh, yeah, Alessandro, thank you as well for, uh, for, for the introduction before. From, from, from my view, I think it is very important um, on the public image of commodity trading. Uh, the improvement opportunities are there, but it's all, it's all has to do an, an, on a balanced line. And, and topics of greenwashing are, are something that we need to keep in mind. 
uh, that we do not do things uh, or that the, that the, the, the trading industry does not do things that later on we look back on and say like, oh yeah, no, that was, uh, that that was not correct. And, uh, and so we have to keep track and, and, and make sure everything is done correct. And Alexander, um, staying, staying with you, uh, what opportunities and challenges uh, do you see um, carbon offsetting having in future of commodity trading and shipping? Well, there are actually um, uh, greenwashing is, is almost something that, uh, that comes into play. Um, there are a lot of opportunities currently uh, in, in, in the space of carbon offsetting where one has been seeing uh, carbon, uh, carbon neutral uh, commodities where we use the carbon offsets to, 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 to offset an entire voyage of, of fuel oil or crude oil, NAFTAs. Um, then we've also seen uh, um, carbon neutral bunkers uh, where, where the likes of uh, Minerva bunkering have come out and said, oh yeah, there's a, uh, we have, uh, <coughs> we, we, we're offering carbon neutral bunkers. Well, at the one point, one of the, one of the challenges you see in this is, is somewhat of a, almost a double counting, right? <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, 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 and which is a good thing in, in a sense in, in, in that case there potentially. Um, and then you also have the ideas of, of carbon neutral voyages um, where, where voyages are being offset um, and, and, and entire fleet emissions are also being offset. So um, there are challenges and it's a bit volatile right now on that space and which avenue will come out to see, see the light of day is, is going to be a... a um, is, is going to be, uh, uh, yeah, we will f we'll find that out at the end. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Alexander. And Paul, probably staying with you, um, I would like to tackle a little bit terminology because there are different notions flying around. Sustainable, responsible, carbon neutral, green. How to deal with them and what is the risk of misusing those terms for a trading company? Yes, uh, I totally agree with uh, with uh, what uh, Alexander said uh, previously. So uh, there is a uh, many risk of uh, of uh, greenwashing of charges for, for for groups if they are not uh, uh, using those uh, notion terminology uh, properly. And uh, as you said, uh, there are many notions: uh, sustainable, responsible, green, uh, carbon neutral, climate neutral, and now net zero emission, uh, which is a uh, quite a common uh, wording, but it's. Those notions are pretty uh, complex to, uh, to grasp. Let's say only for carbon neutrality. What does it mean uh, to be carbon neutral? Uh, to be carbon neutral, it, 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 it implies to, uh, to measure, to reduce, and then to offset uh, the, the carbon footprint of a, of, a, of a scope. But which scope uh, do we, does it include? Is it, uh, in, is it uh, the, the corporate scope? Is it only uh, the, the, the freight of a, of a transaction? Is it, is it uh, the production of a commodity, the, the end use, uh, the production to delivery? So the scope are pretty difficult to, to first to, to define. It's pretty complex to define the scope. And also, um, which, uh, which carbon footprint do you have to, to measure? Is it uh, only the, the CO2, the carbon, or all the greenhouse gases uh, as, uh, as, uh, with, uh, with uh, methane, uh, sulfur, uh, and so on? So uh, that's for the measure. And for the offset, uh, that's also a, a complex issue because there are many standards to, uh, to claim for, for carbon reduction and offset. And the use of those, uh, of those uh, notions and terminology uh, have to be uh, care carefully uh, managed by, uh, by groups to ensure that uh, they are aligned with uh, the best standards and the best uh, regulation. It's a question of credibility for, for those groups in order to avoid, as Alexander says, any backlash of uh, greenwashing uh, charges if they are uh, misused. And uh, uh, any misuse of those uh, notions and, uh, and uh, in communications may be very harmful for the reputation of groups, traders, producers. And it's uh, especially now, as, a, as the, that's a major issue for, for, for the market, for public, uh, but also for partners and, uh, and financiers. Plus. And I would say also that uh, uh, as uh, those notions and regulations are changing, evolving pretty quickly, it's pretty important for, for groups, traders and producers to, uh, to internalize uh, some skills to, uh, to know or to grasp uh, those notions. So either by uh, developing uh, skills internally or to, uh, to be supported and uh, advised with a uh, with, uh, with, uh, Partners who may uh, we may help them to uh, to ensure that their communication, their strategy, uh, 
uh, are aligned with, uh, with, uh, with the standards. And I think that we've seen a couple of players in the market burning their fingers just because, just because of that. So, um, Richard, how do you see a difference in the concept of sustainability between the different sizes of commodity companies? Think of small, medium, and large companies. Is there a difference? Um, I mean, I think fundament fundamentally there isn't a difference between how these companies should be approaching it. Um, but I would draw on some of the things that Paul was saying, that there's a lot of uh, different terminology. Um, how do you actually measure it? And it's something that it's it's a little bit opaque at the moment. I mean, when we talk about the concept of sustainability, it's quite difficult to really pin down what we're actually talking about. And I think that makes it a little bit difficult at the moment. Within large, large companies, um, they have a slightly different approach towards it because, first of all, they do have more of a public image. They're potentially listed companies and they also have to look into their, their financing requirements. And so they will have the resources to either build up departments or to have uh, external consultants who are helping them with their sustainability. Um, again, what Alex said, it's important not to just focus on what we're doing in terms of the image of it, but actually do it properly. And so, I mean, sustainability, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about, um, you know, the carbon footprint. Yes, we're talking about the diversity with the team, but essentially what it boils down to is do our actions have negative consequences on other people? That's you know basically what it boils down to in the long run. Um, and so this is something that's perfectly accessible to any size of company. I think that as we understand the concept better and as we become more comfortable with it, then it will filter down into medium and small size companies. And I mean, I was looking the other day how to make my company sustainable. And I was given a list of about five or six different things which were, you know, have a a diverse working force, um, be careful of your carbon footprint. Um, and there were things that essentially they, they, as long as you're being a relatively nice person, then you tend to be complying with a lot of these things. They're not unachievable goals. And so I think they will filter down through the industry over time and we'll see the whole industry aligning a lot more uh, in the future. Yeah, I think it's a matter of doing the right thing, ultimately. And I'll probably now would like to have a look at, at shipping because 90% of all traded goods um, are transported via vessel. And Alexander, how do you see the upcoming environmental regulation affecting shipping? Uh, what will be the role of some voluntary initiatives such as the Poseidon principles or the sea cargo charter? Yeah, I think... Um... <clears throat> It relates relates really much with uh, with what we've been talking about before, um, and 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 how and how the how different players are approaching this, and and and, and shipping being a very traditional industry uh, with different with different cultures and different backgrounds. Um, it, it is uh, and also uh, being outside of the, the Paris Agreement regulations uh, and having to design their own via the IMO. It's a it's a very slow process, and uh, and so um, and 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 so what we're going to see is now, and what we have been seeing is 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 a lot of also volatility on different types of approaches on the voluntary side, but also on regulations where we've seen that the EU has uh, has come out and 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 is saying, okay, well, we are looking to um, we are looking to uh, to regulate shipping uh, with that with the EU ETS. Uh, because the IMO is 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 slow in acting on it, or in acting on any uh, efficient proposal that's going to push forward the decarbonization of shipping. So um, <clears throat> we have the Poseidon principles, which is uh, which is the initiative from the banks to 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 keep track of vessels' uh, uh, annual emissions uh, uh, ratings, and 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 based on that, uh, give a, give a finance fallout uh, if they cannot comply. And Sea Cargo Charter is looking at the EEOI, the uh, energy efficiency operational index to see uh, uh, to see obviously uh, how uh, well vessels are being operated and and how 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 more efficient they're being uh, in reducing their emissions. So um, we see these uh, we see these initiatives um, uh, and which one then will survive the coming regulations <laughs> will also be will also be a question um, because at the end of the day the idea is always to do with voluntary initiatives better than regulations. And so there again, 
um, we hope that uh, that any type of these initiatives are uh, are always going to keep that in mind as well. Yeah. Thank you, Alexander. And probably on, on the same on the same line of thought, Paul. Um, there are more and more announcements for carbon neutral LNG or oil or metal transactions. Uh, but what are the drivers behind it? Yes, indeed, indeed, there are, we see uh, many uh, producers, uh, traders also uh, in energy first, but in minerals and even in agriculture, communicating about um, uh, carbon neutral uh, transaction. And it's, uh, it's pretty new, it's uh, for the past uh, six months, one year, there are more and more announcements like that. And uh, uh, I see that. I believe that uh, I see that uh, the, the 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 main driver of all those uh, for those announcements is, uh, is that we see a growing demand from uh, and buyers from commodity buyers for decarbonized uh, commodity supply chain. And indeed, as uh, as uh, as Alexander uh, said, uh, there's uh, more and more groups uh, uh, implementing a net zero emission targets uh, to be net zero emission uh, be net zero emission to be uh, recognized as net zero emission. It implies to uh, to, uh, to measure and to offset uh, all the uh, direct uh, emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, not only CO2, but all the, the, the six main gases, from uh, the uh, direct use. So the direct emission of, uh, of the, uh, uh, for the company. So let's say for, for, for a gas, uh, for a utility, that's uh, the emissions related to the gas burn to produce electricity, but also indirect emissions, so uh, emissions related to the supply chain, to the value chain. For a gas uh, buyer, uh, for utility, it's, uh, it means uh, to, uh, to calculate and reduce to zero all the greenhouse gases from the production, from the, from the production of the gas. Uh, for, for a coffee trader, we, have, uh, we see uh, also uh, many food industry uh, uh, claiming uh, their, um, announcing their, their, their net zero emission targets. So it means that they have to uh, to ensure that all the the supply chain from the production, of the coffee in the in the field in uh, in Africa to their uh, to, to the factory and then to the end user is uh, is uh, uh, decarbonized. So there is a green demand from buyers uh, for, for for decarbonized uh, supply chain, and of course producers and traders they uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they they respond to this uh, to this demand. Uh, I think also that there's, there's a, we see a growing demand, a growing pressure uh, from uh, from financiers, from uh, trade finance banks. Uh, banks are a core pillar in the, in the industry, as uh, as you know, and uh, uh, banks uh, that choose to uh, to be uh, uh, that, uh, that are still uh, financing the, uh, the, uh, the industry and uh, and uh, especially the oil and gas, the extractive industry, now are pretty turn between the, 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 the business uh, business as usual to finance this industry and uh, their, their, their own uh, policy, uh, sustainable policy. Most of banks have, uh, have uh, set up uh, sustainable uh, uh, criteria uh, standards uh, in their uh, financing decision. And uh, they ask, uh, they ask uh, their clients to uh, to commit to uh, to be also uh, to commit to supporting uh, sustainability. So, because because first uh, those banks uh, they have their own uh, their own uh, objective, but they also uh, face uh, pressure from uh, their shareholders, from the public, and of course from uh, from uh, regulators. So, uh, those banks are uh, are asking uh, uh, their clients, uh, community buyers, traders, producers, to. Uh, to commit to, uh, to decarbonize uh, their uh, their own uh, activity. Uh, so we see we see uh, a growing demand from buyers, a growing demand from all the industry stakeholders for uh, for decarbonized commodity transactions. And the question is still how uh, how the, how those uh, those uh, those uh, transactions are done. So uh, uh, as it's a pretty complex issue. It's uh, it's uh, it's important for for those groups and for for, for those banks to uh, to ensure that the measurement of the of the carbon footprint of those transactions and the offset and the reduction is uh, is properly uh, done uh, based on the most uh, advanced and recognized uh, standards. We we discussed that 
it is a matter of doing the, the right thing as well. And probably a question that I would ask to, uh, to the three of you is basically, I'm sometime, let me put it another way. I often hear the feedback that there are additional costs that will reduce margins, and sometimes this will have an impact in a price-driven uh, price market. But what would be the interest, aside of the do the right thing, for the industry in committing to taking a new path? Well, I, I would, I would um, jump in here and, and say that I think one of the uh, one of the interesting things are all the new opportunities that are arising for the industry, be it uh, ammonia, be it uh, hydrogen, uh, be it uh, uh, um, uh, be it uh, even carbon credits and, and trading those. There's a lot of new, um, let's say, new trading desks that are that are opening up within trading companies. And so for that, there's also a lot of opportunity to gain new margin and also have a competitive edge and, uh, and, and arbitrage those opportunities as well. So I think uh, that, is, that is one of the, um, one of the interests. And that's why you see each, each trader uh, out there choosing one of them, once you know, looking more at ammonia, once looking more at hydrogen, once looking more at methanol. Uh, and so they're, you know, everyone's taking their stance in, into, into seeing what then is the winning uh, future fuel <laughs> so yeah I just add on top of uh, add on top of what Alexander said. I mean, I think in in any situation like this, it's a question of trying to identify the opportunities, and that's something that the the world of commodity trading has always been very very strong at. Uh, it's really identifying the opportunities in the business. Um, I mean, there are a number of different opportunities here. Um, Paul talked quite quite a lot about financing, and we've seen different uh, financing uh, arrangements being put in place. I mean, Dreyfus had a a line of credit which was about seven hundred fifty million dollars, which was uh, um, the interest was linked to the emissions. Gunvor also had a, a line of credit about the same amount, which was linked to the carbon uh, emissions. And so this is also an opportunity for some of the small trading companies, which are having a lot of trouble finding financing. This could be an opportunity to put them apart, to actually set them aside from the rest of the field and open up doors for financing. It's also, I mean, we we have this focus of shipping or of trading and talking about it as almost a standalone industry, whereas we're just a link in the chain. We're linking the whole chain. And I think more and more we're going to be looking at that more extensive chain and we're going to be looking from end to end. And so the more that shipping or trading companies can be a sustainable link in that in that chain chain, then the more beneficial it's going to be for their business. They're going to have a competitive advantage against their competitors. And that's an obvious opportunity. Now, how much of a financial opportunity it is on day one is difficult to say. But again, that's what investment's all about. That's what, you know, taking the lead in this kind of situation is. The problem is there are going to be a lot of dead ends. There's going to be a lot of investment just made for, we don't know whether it's made for a good uh, long-term purpose. Um, but that's why we need predictability at the moment. We need to know what where we're going to be going forward. And I mean, in this subject, it's easiest to focus on emissions because it's something that's very, very tangible. But we don't really know where we're going to be in, in you know, 10 years. We don't know what the regulations are going to be. And what we really need is, is a bit of a, a, a level playing field. We need something where everyone can actually look and say, okay, this is what we're aiming for. This is what we need to do. And if we look at using LNG as fuel, it's a very good example. If we were to transform over to using LNG as fuel for all of the ships around the world tomorrow, great. However, it is still a carbon-based fuel. So is that a long-term solution? I don't know. And I haven't seen the figures, but I'm sure that the cost for investing in the infrastructure for supplying that fuel to all these vessels around the world would be, I mean, we're talking billions and billions of dollars. And so essentially that investment would be valid for how many years? Would we turn around in five, 10 years and say, okay, well, that was a good idea, but actually we've got something much better. And so I think that we need to put pressure on the regulatory bodies in order for them to create this level playing field. And the Chicago Charter is doing a very good job. Uh, Traffic Euro came out with um, their push for a, a tax on carbon, which I think is very, very, very promising. Um, which of these is the best, the best 
as well? I don't know. But the fact that we're seeing so much at the moment and we're seeing so many pressure from so many different angles, from the financing angle, from the consumer angle, from the public image am- angle, I think that's really offering us an opportunity right now to make a massive step forward in our business. So it's probably the, one of the biggest step forward that we've seen in years and years and years. And the wonderful thing with trading and shipping is that it changes very, very, very slowly except for when it changes fast. And then it changes very, very, very quickly. And I think this is a fantastic opportunity for us to move forward in the right direction. And I agree agree with you because sometimes LNG as well is seen as a bridge fuel between the the dirty energy to the clean energy. But sometimes we tend to forget that it's made of methane, which is 80 times worse than CO2. So there is also a lot of of noise happening, happening right now. And I think that in the past, 30 years, the narrative around climate change has been, oh my God, the house is on fire. And probably we should change it to, oh my God, there is a lot of opportunity and money to be made from the energy transition. So yeah, I totally agree with you. And Paul, maybe- Yes, uh, I I, I totally agree with uh, with, uh, what Alexander and Richard uh, just said. And uh, and, uh, just to bounce back on on, on the financing point that uh, Richard mentioned, we see that now some banks are, uh, are already offering some uh, better uh, financing condition to those uh, groups that are uh, uh, really committed in uh, and for 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 sustainable transition or sustainable business line, and now they are offering uh, uh, better financing condition. But we may expect in in few uh, in few years uh, to, uh, to 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 have some constraining uh, financing condition that to be it's pretty difficult to be to to, to finance some uh, not sustainable business like let's say now to to find to uh, to find a uh, financing support for for coal mining or a coal power plant is already pretty uh, difficult and it's uh, so that's why that's one of the main reasons that uh, the many uh, many uh, projects for coal uh, plants are are, uh, are cancelled so that's uh, the first thing and uh, the other point that uh, business opportunities are, are obvious in a, in a, in energy transition now uh, let's say most of the major uh, trading houses uh, based in uh, Switzerland, for instance, uh, well known, are already investing massively in hydrogen, in biogas, in renewable, uh, because uh, they see business opportunities there. And in five years, in ten years, uh, they, we may expect uh, those uh, margins and uh, and trading opportunity on those markets to be far uh, more uh, appealing than uh, than than on coal market, for instance. Hydrogen is not a commodity right now. It's not a liquid market, but it will be. Uh, it will be uh, quite soon. We have seen the first uh, hydrogen uh, carrier built uh, and launched uh, last year in, in Japan to trade uh, hydrogen from Australia to uh, to, uh, to to Japan, and uh, that's a uh, that's the sense of the story. So I think that we do. We have not to, to, to consider sustainability as a as a as a as a cost of grading uh, profitability and uh, and PNL for traders. But uh, definitely, as a as a as a way to uh, to improve a uh, competitive advantage, to explore new markets and uh, and the, the the markets uh, of tomorrow, and um, and uh, just to, to to respond to, uh, to yeah, the new demands and and uh, and, uh, and see the business opportunities. And those groups that are not committed in uh, in that way, uh, will be excluded to uh, to uh, from from those markets. This brings. This virtual event to, to a close. Uh, Richard, Alexander, Paul, thank you for sharing uh, your insights. Uh, the next event and the last of this series on sustainability in the commodities markets is next Thursday. Same day, same hour. So you can find additional information on LinkedIn and on the CTA website, www.cta-association.com. So thank you and stay safe. Thank you, everyone.